I'm, a, I'm about to go rapid fire here for a second. Keep a real key eye on uh, whoever's got their hands. Like, oh, uh, just so I know, because we're kind of well, we'll, we'll be okay, but Steve's got to be like quick. Yeah. All right, welcome back everyone. Uh, so as I learned through my research this year, it's one thing to have a seemingly great idea, theory, or concept, and another thing entirely to translate that idea into practice. Uh, the military profession is by nature a practical one, and we are evaluated not by our intent, but rather by what we achieve against thinking and adaptive competitors and adversaries in the real world. New doctrine, although heavily grounded in history and experience, is also of necessity forward-looking to a degree, uh, especially during periods of rapid and increasing technological, social, and geopolitical change. As a result, new concepts often struggle to find their footing when measured against real-world environments and challenges. This cu current cohort of information advantage scholars had the opportunity to grapple with the challenges of translating theory, concept, and doctrine into practice this year through a series of engagements with doctrine authors, tactical units, and cross-functional practitioners. This panel is intended to stimulate some dialogue on the challenges and opportunities of operationalizing novel doctrine. And so uh, with that in mind, uh, you know, I'll have a, 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 some unique challenges in terms of stimulating some what I hope is very engaging discussion without losing too many friends because I am not an 06. Um, but with that in mind, I'll go ahead and get things uh, kicked off with uh, my own uh, you know, introduction and then I'll go on down the line and uh, um, we'll get this panel kicked off. Uh, so uh, I'm Major Matt Riley, I'm an Air Force Intelligence Officer and my thesis is uh, entitled Doctrine, Dogma, and Design, Innovation and Adaptation in Early Army Air Force's Strategic Planning. What I wanted to do was take a look back through history to gain some perspective on the challenges of translating theory, doctrine, into practice uh, in an environment that uh, roughly resembles uh, what we're currently facing today. Uh, to do that, uh, what I did, although no historical analogy is uh, perfect, some are better than others, but I thought by looking at the interwar period and World War II uh, that it could uh, help me understand a little bit better the dynamics involved with emerging uh, domains in warfare and integrating them into operational planning. So to do that, I looked at the efforts of the Air War Plans Division, uh, which was a, a team of four uh, field grade officers who together uh, authored a series of strategic estimates that formed uh, the foundation of the U.S.'s uh, strategic um, air campaign during World War II. Uh, furthermore, those documents operationalized the concept of uh, high-altitude precision daylight bombing that was developed during that interwar period uh, and ultimately proved to be prohibitively costly and almost led to disaster later on throughout World War II. And so I was specifically interested in looking at how the planners, the, the road they took to get to AWP D1, that first draft uh, that they produced in August of 1941 before the U.S. became a party to the conflict, uh, and then especially how they adapted their uh, beliefs, concepts, and uh, assumptions uh, about a year later uh, when they drafted a subsequent uh, strategic estimate named AWPD-42. The brief answer is uh, they really didn't adapt, and there's multiple factors that help explain a little bit why that are relevant to modern military professionals. Uh, the first is uh, those intrinsic cognitive biases that are still alive and well today, uh, particularly confirmation bias um, and mirror imaging uh, that certainly plagued multiple aspects of uh, their planning and analysis. Uh, but particularly insidious um, was the planner's failure to appreciate the nature of the assumptions they were making about their operational doctrine. The planners had a tendency to conceptualize their assumptions as discrete and isolated from uh, you know, each other or each of the other assumptions so that a flaw in one assumption wasn't catastrophic to the concept as a whole. Uh, in practice, of course, those assumptions are very closely linked uh, so that deficiencies in one area had a cascading and compounding effect across multiple other critical elements of their doctrine uh, which should have illuminated those critical flaws. Uh, that being said, there were significant institutional pressures that helped propel uh, these plans forward almost to disaster. Um, as a card-carrying member of the Air Service, I can say that we've always been a little bit uppity when it comes to notions of independence and autonomy, and these planners were no exception. Uh, both themselves and the senior air leaders 
uh, saw these plans as a vehicle to pursue and justify greater autonomy for, and independence for the air service um, by demonstrating that air power alone could achieve rapid and decisive outcomes in conflict irrespective of uh, the other domains. And so that was the lens by which the planners interpreted their observations in the field and helped justify uh, pursuing a flawed concept forward. So with that in mind, of course, I'm happy to talk all day about history, uh, but I'll, I'll, I, we already heard a little bit from Steve, uh, but, so I'll kick it on over to Liz. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Major Liz Hall. I've been a Marine Corps log, uh, logistics officer for 15 years now. Um, however, I'm transitioning into information maneuver field for the Marine Corps, and so my current primary job is student. Um, but my, my topic, my thesis, I looked at narco trafficking. Um, explicitly, how does the Marine Corps take lessons from narco trafficking uh, from an information perspective? And how can I integrate that with logistics uh, for the Marine Corps going forward? Um, so some background, the Marine Corps acknowledged information as war fighting function uh, a couple years ago. Our first doctrinal publication came out over the summer last year. Um, and a lot of times, in the Marine, from a Marine perspective, everything is focused on the infantry. So we always think of doctrine, we think of integration, is how does this help the, the infantrymen on the ground? But what we don't do a lot of is looking at how do these other um, integration efforts apply to other warfighting functions. So I took a look at some narco trafficking, uh, specifically the FARC in Colombia, um, how they kind of did internal sustainment to their guerrilla fight, uh, and how they really kicked off the trend of narco subs for uh, transiting in the, in the Caribbean and the Pacific. Um, so those are two of my case studies. And then my third case study was a, a less hierarchical organization of narco traffickers in Vietnam um, in the last 20 years. So major um, things I looked at for the Marine Corps, we look at information advantage uh, explicitly through three different advantages. The one I looked at was system overmatch. Uh, if I look at logistics as a system, how do I win at logistics by overmatching my opponent? Uh, within information advantage for the Marine Corps, there's, there's four functions. So how do I generate information? How do I preserve information? Deny and, and project it at will to achieve that system overmatch. Um, as I looked into or the outcomes of my study, I found specific trends or certain trends uh, multimodal transportation, so very rarely did these organizations rely on one, one mode. They had a lot of uh, flexibility built in. They understood networks at the lowest level. How do individuals understand networks and then know how to operate to make that network work to their advantage? Um, flooding the zone, heavy for logistics, like we expect some amount of loss. But for example, the FARC would expect upwards of 50% loss um, and still turn a profit. So what does that look like in competition in the future? And then finally, like what all these organizations did was they really sought to conceal identity and use camouflage. So I just pulled the examples from that to apply to Marine Corps logistics <coughs> in the future. So that turn over to Brian Hamill. Hey, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Brian Hamill. Uh, I looked at soft contributions to space warfare. So back in 2021, uh, Lieutenant General John Braga of the United States Army Special Operations Command uh, pitched this idea that the special operations, space, and cyber communities should have kind of a symbiotic relationship to converge capabilities to produce effects uh, across the competition continuum as kind of a separate deterrence mechanism uh, for policymakers. And if you look at the nodes of the triad, um, I think the special operations and cyber piece it's fairly well understood, but I started looking at the space piece, and in the triad itself, there's always these two-way arrows. And so if you read Doctrine as it stands right now, it's very much soft receiving effects from space. So whether that's SATCOM, whether that's GPS, GEOINT, SIGINT, all of that is fairly well understood. But I really wanted to kind of look at the inverse of that and look at what can soft contribute back to the space, uh, the space domain. And so when you really kind of break that apart, um, I think there was a really big misnomer in the soft community that space warfare is orbital warfare, and that's really not the case. So a lot of space warfare is looking at the terrestrial infrastructure and the people behind that that are making that work. Um, and so in 2015, the P-3 
PRC developed kind of this separate branch of their, the PLA called the Strategic Support Force, and it combines their cyber, their space, and their EW, and they have a global disposition. Well, ironically, SOF has a global disposition as well, and so how can we look at degrading uh, their physical infrastructure um, and then look at kind of deception efforts on the ground? And so all my research was kind of tailored around that, and so in the end, you know, like my modest recommendations are you look at preparation of the environment, uh, if you look at special reconnaissance, military information support operations, um, in an effort to deceive, deny, degrade, disrupt, or destroy their space enabling infrastructure. And so ultimately, I came out with a definition for space enabling infrastructure that we should look at presenting to the joint staff so we can all kind of get on the same sheet of music, um, look at greater collaboration between the soft PSYOP counterparts and then the uh, equities under Spacecom that are focused on altering adversary decision making because I would offer if you have guys and gals in the soft side formation that you know live breathe and eat influence and deception then maybe they should uh, look at greater collaboration those space spacecom equities um, and I think all the literature there historically kind of supports this whether we look at um, kind of to Matt's point AWPD1 and looking at destroying kind of niche resources whether we're looking at the OSS uh, sabotage manuals um, and half a different other, you know, prominent authors, student theses, um, and irregular warfare concepts all really support this. Uh, and so with that, I'll pass it off to Chris. Good morning. Uh, so my name is Chris Messnard. I'm an Air Force Public Affairs Officer. I really have a lot of experience uh, working at the 06 level for the Air Force. And then uh, at the joint level, I've been anywhere from JTF level up to combatant command. So. Uh, just to kind of give you an understanding of how I framed my perspective when I got into researching. Uh, and then the topics that really interest me uh, going into this were joint planning and then uh, this discussion of the narrative and how it fits into our joint planning process. Uh, so I'm looking at this mostly from a department view down, uh, Department of Defense that is. And the reason I was interested in this is um, there's this kind of, there's this comment that gets floated around occasionally and it's essentially something along the lines of us losing a narrative battle or a narrative conflict. And the question I kind of retort back with is, how do you even measure whether you're losing, much less winning a narrative battle? Uh, and so that was kind of something that was an under driving, uh, underlying uh, driver for when I went forth and did my research. Uh, so with that in mind, I set out and did my literature review as every good researcher does. And one of the things that stood out to me is that when we look at the joint doctrine, specifically with regard to planning, but also breaking that out to our functional doctrines, kind of four disciplines start to emerge in terms of how we talk about narratives. And really that's categorized as historical, uh, sociocultural, and then uh, communication. But then there's this uh, other element about cognitive narratives that gets referred to, but doesn't really come out within the doctrine as to what that actually means. And so as I dug a little bit deeper, um, I start to get into this idea of cognitive narratives are really a process that kind of have this similarity to another one that's well-researched called heuristics. So if you've ever read Daniel Kahneman, he really goes into the heuristic and bias uh, concept as to how that affects our perceptions of reality and then uh, our decision-making. So just taking that a little bit further, uh, how do we operationalize the idea of narrative? And so another key uh, resource that I looked at or influencer was basically uh, Kendall Haven's research into story as a, as a complementary process that's intertwined and interactive with narrative. And so if you can think of the two as uh, in that nature where they're, they can't be basically broken apart from each other, you can take story and the, the different elements that Kendall Haven broke down and apply that uh, in an operational sense or a planning sense to say like an op approach. Uh, and then in your current ops, you can look at your, say your uh, sync matrix and then as you get into uh, your assessments, typically there's some sort of operational assessments matrix that takes place. And so with those things in mind, I basically try to circle back and answer my question essentially of why does narrative matter? How do you assess your effectiveness when it comes to narrative? And then um, how do you basically refine your plans going forward? Uh, so with that, I will turn it back over to Matt. All righty, and a very similar rules of engagement for last time. Yeah, I've got a few questions on deck and I'd like to ask the first one. Uh, but ultimately, we're here to provide perspective to you. Uh, and so uh, at any time, you know, please feel free to stick your hands up in the air, um, and I'll, I'll make sure we call on you, and uh, you can interrupt our regularly scheduled programming as you please. Uh, but with that in mind, uh, you know, we do have uh, quite the joint buffet uh, up on the stage right now. And so I'd like to try to start maybe a little bit of a fight early on and ask the simple question to each of you, should information be a warfighting function and why? So starting with you, Steve. 
<laughs> Very simply, yes, for, for a couple pragmatic reasons. One, it aligns with joint and marine doctrine, and there's there's no reason the Army should should misalign in that um, misalign in that domain. Um, it just creates additional friction. Uh, the Marines and uh, the Joint Force kind of have it already ingrained, so at this point, the order has been given. Um, but beyond that, um, our argument for not including it as a warfighting function and instead breaking it up into multiple different how many angels can head on, dance on the head of a pin doctrinal uh, differences uh, does not make sense. And uh, I'm also going to say yes, because the Marine Corps told me to. Um, <laughs> we will tell the Commandant. <laughs> yes. Oh, actually, it's, it's, uh, yeah, it's uh, well, the retired General Mattis, and we will do anything he says immediately. <laughs> um, no, but when I look at information as a warfighting function um, through the last uh, year, it's interesting to me because I guess the argument for it is it's a set of activities that lead or support operations or inform decisions. So when I, I my favorite, I was working with a uh, army engineer and he's like, everyone needs to do protection. We, we call it force protection, but you know, everyone digs a fighting hole. And I'm like, okay, well, if, if everyone digs a fighting hole, everyone's doing protection, then a war fighting function is something that everyone has a part of. Um, so for the Marines, we look at it as everyone has a role in information. It affects everything. So by categorizing it as its own war fighting function, not only are we paying attention to it more, but we're also probably gonna be able to align resources to it as far as training, doctrine, um, education. Um, and then the joint perspective going through the pubs is it's a way for commanders to organize tasks in that, in that area or that domain. So I think from a, I mean, doctrine can change if we decide it doesn't work out, okay, we can change it back, but right now it lets us focus on the idea of information um, and how do we manage that um, at speed as it proliferates. So I feel pretty confident fighting anyone in this room, so I'll, I'll disagree. <laughs> uh, right, so in my, in my professional opinion, you're, you're robbing Peter to pay Paul, and it's not, if you take the existing G39 construct and you just kind of separate it out, like that's really all you're doing, but like what are the underlying issues of what you're actually trying to address? And sure that, what I think what you're actually trying to do is get an equal seat at the table, right? Um, so the boss can pay attention to it. And so what you're, I think you're really looking at is the efficacy of your FA-30s. And so what I would like flip back like to Liz and to Steve is like I trust Steve and John to do the right things and I know they're going to integrate with the J2 like they should, be integrated in that fire cell, be integrated with the J3, the J4, and the J6. Um, so what I would offer is it, is it really, does it need to be separated by itself and potentially now that it's separated, um, does that present its own challenges because now they're even more isolated and potentially ostracized? Or can they still do their job from inside the three, integrate with all the staff sections like they should uh, with all the IRCs and still have that benefit of the outcome for the commander? And ultimately, I think it's how that commander chooses to use that J39 or G39. Uh, if he doesn't really see the efficacy of the information he's using, then he's going to cast them aside. But if he understands how to work with his three and his XO and integrate them into his ops and intel, then I don't really see a huge issue with the existing construct as it is. Um, right, so acknowledge it's a joint function. Um, but again, I think it comes down to, um, like I said, the talent of your, your IO officer the IRCs underneath them. Um, and we went to North Carolina earlier this year, like as an example, um, on their last rotation, like they weren't using managed attribution systems when they were doing research in the information environment. And so part of that is FA30 to FA30 in conventional force, but then I would also offer it's like, how are those FA30s synchronizing with the soft community for things that we've been doing like five or six years before this? Um, and I would offer like getting decent results in the information environment. And so that's kind of my, my pushback on those two. Yeah, so back to the or original question. Sure, if you think it needs to be a warfighting function and that helps you in your doctrine, then go for it. Uh, I would say that the, the ways in which it does matter uh, kind of have already been covered. So it prioritizes the, uh, the funding allocation, the manpower, but then to Brian's point, at that, are you, are you really just uh, you know, robbing one echelon to then feed another one? Uh, does it really have the effect that you're looking for? Can you take what the structure already looks like and then uh, conceptually 
uh, work with that to get at what you're after. Uh, but then my argument as to why maybe it doesn't need to be its own special uh, thing is that information is so inherent to literally everything that we do. We kind of heard that on the last panel with the data literacy and data collection. Uh, information is a core process that's helped, or sorry, uh, information feeds our mental processes in terms of how we make decisions. We can only take in so much and process so much information at any given point, and that reflects also in terms of how a staff operates. So if you look at how the Air Force has gone, uh, they have this information warfare cohort. I still couldn't really tell you what that actually means other than now I get uh, rated against some other people who kind of have information in their job title. Uh, the Marines, I think, have the best kind of construct on the ground right now in terms of publication and then how they're operationalizing it. And the Army is really, uh, as you've already kind of heard alluded to, trying to muddle around with how do they take this and turn it into, say, you know, the MBTF has been kind of the go-to right now, but uh, you also hear the word TIAD and nobody can quite seem to answer what the heck that's actually going to do for us. So I think there's some operational um, lessons out there that can be learned from, but I would also say as you're going through, ask the, the deliberate question of what's not working or where kind of the hiccups been. Uh, and I think you'll find some more value in, in answering that. So to, uh, to Chris and Brian's point, I, I actually agree. Um, at least, uh, you know, for the reasoning, but I'm, I'm being kind of pragmatic here because uh, what the Army has done instead is just break up information and influence into, um, you know, artificially separate elements as a form of contact and a dynamic of combat power, and I add that that just adds additional friction. Like we are having pointless philosophical debates. Uh, so just from a purely like pragmatic, let's, let's get in line um, and we can kind of hit the necessities of, of what Brian and Chris were talking about um, outside of the, the, the doctrinal philosophy discussion. Um, so let's just align with joint and, and marine doctrine, keep it simple, understand that there's absolutely a resources and competition piece and potential risk of separating out the G39 further, which I'm um, was gonna talk about one of our other questions. Uh, it's a huge issue, 100% agree with Brian on that. But I think at this point, it's just creating more friction than it's worth to fight um, kind of fight what's already been done. Um, it's kind of a solved problem, and it is uh, just generating pointless debate that doesn't operationalize anything. Alrighty, so with that in mind, and at the risk of getting beaten up in the hallway after this during the break, I am gonna call a little bit of an audible then, uh, since it was brought up a, a few different times, and, uh, and ask as well, uh, does the G or J39 construct need to change then, um, as we look at some of the practical implementation of information advantage as a concept? If you want, I can start at the higher, more kind of operational echelon, and then maybe uh, Brian and Steve can, can tag team the more tactical level. So at the combatant command level, I would say that the J-39 construct, um, in some regards, it's effective, but then others, it's become this staff function that exists to self-serve. And so when we talk to, we've gone out and engaged with some of the combatant commands out there, they've found essentially workarounds on their staffs to make uh, the function work as it's suited to the purpose that they have versus just trying to essentially take the J-39 and restructure it in a way that works for them. So I think really what you're, where you're seeing some adaption, uh, adaption at the um, combatant command level, and you could probably extend that down to some of the subunified command levels, is what is the purpose and intent of, a, of the organization? Uh, what's the utility of the function that we're trying to get at? And then how do you go and actually employ that? And they're trying to get away from just being constrained by a specific structure, if that makes any sense. So I struggled with this question, and the only reason I advocated uh, to kind of keep the G39 cell uh, not as a warfighting function was because I knew Liz was going to advocate it for as a warfighting <laughs> function. Um, because I think there's a compelling case to be made, and as I reflect on my own thesis for space, um, you can look at space as kind of a sub-equity of fires, or you can look at space warfare as an information warfare. And so if you think of like the preponderance of what constellations in low Earth orbit are doing, they're doing SIGINT and they're doing GEOINT, right? So they're either looking or they're listening. And so that in turn is gonna feed your commander's decision cycle arguably faster than your adversaries to let you make better decisions. And so does space belong, in the, like I said, in the fire cell or the information cell? Do your other information related capabilities belong under the three as maneuver elements? 
or do they belong in the kind of this like separate information cell, right? Um, I think the G39 construct, like I'll stand by my opinion, is, is fine as it stands right now just because there's, I don't see the utility in cut and pasting it to a different organization. Like acknowledging Steve's point, but like who's to say just because uh, the joint force does it, Steve as an FA30 under the G39 can't talk with like that joint force IO officer. So I'll leave it at that. And I'll jump in by saying, so I had a talk with um, someone at the, the second MEF information group yesterday, and they're still trying to figure out what that looks like for the Marine Corps, so I can't offer you know anything tried and true or even experimental at this point. Um, I like the idea of the the three nine from what I've seen this this year, um, particularly as long as it falls under the three. I think the main thing is to keep it tied into operations, and sometimes that becomes a uh, personality issue, um, or at least it can be um, resolved through active personalities. But I think the main thing is your opso, your threes, need to really embrace that capability. Um, it's not only a place to herd cats and dogs, but if it's got the threes blessing and you can force it down to that tactical level, this is coming from someone who is 15 years, sure, logistics is a war fighting function that everyone says is like, you know, the key to victory, and then everyone says at the last second, hey, I need that thing that you needed to order uh, six months ago. Um, so having the 3-9 available so that folks know to go to that, it's consolidated, it's a, it's a place to have that conversation is important, but also getting the word out that folks need to think of these things ahead of time so you can make that integration work. So uh, going back to our first panel, uh, acknowledging this is kind of anecdote on my part, um, I've been fortunate or unfortunate enough to work in a 3-9 or 3-9 equivalent from uh, the combatant command level, uh, soft, conventional, down to the actually Marine Battalion Task Force. Um, and I kind of come up along the same lines as, as Brian and Liz. Uh, the concept of the 3-9, whatever you want to call it, um, should exist. I'm, I'm mostly okay with, with how it is needs to remain tied into the three. Um, now there's probably some changes that need to happen within its structure and probably more along the lines of just allow it, allowing it to be more tailorable so long as it achieves whatever its you know, specific tasks are in that organization. Um, but a lot of the issues are gonna come down to, uh, actually one of the other questions we're gonna get to, um, how do staff processes and how do things like that need to change? So I'm totally fine with the structure, call it whatever you want, um, but the major issues are going to be within the personalities, training, and, and folks within it and how business is actually done within the 3-9. Um, but as a structure itself, as its purpose, call it whatever you want to call it, I, I think it's good so long as it's tied in very strongly, um, very strongly agree with this, tied in with the three. All right, thank you. Colonel Crawford? So. I'm not sure how, um, how familiar the audience is with the 3-9 structure. If, if one of you give a real quick brief overview of the capabilities that are there, but also what are those additional skill sets that are needed to achieve information advantage and to operationalize it as a concept? And are they different at the tactical versus the operational level? Uh, Sorry, so the 3-9, whether it be G or J, um, they're basically responsible for what was formerly known as information operations within the Army. Um, they are responsible for integrating and synchronizing, my favorite two words, um, information, well, the things formerly known as information-related capabilities. So typically that consists of cyber, space, STO, MILDEC, OPSEC, COMCAM, PAO. Um, it kind of varies. Um, depending on the organization. Uh, and as, as mentioned, they're part of, uh, part of the three, um, although they rely heavily on the two. Um, and kind of the, the skill sets kind of required there are kind of twofold. One, being able to, well actually threefold. One, being able to kind of herd all the cats together because they're usually working cross-functional, cross-service, and um, cross-echelon uh, to, to get anything done. Uh, two, being able to translate what you're doing into, for lack of a better word, maneuveries, 
Um, it's not super helpful when I go to a geo and just start talking nerd stuff to him. Um, doesn't, doesn't actually say anything. Uh, and three, um, being able to actually take a lot of the intel that wouldn't otherwise be used for certain other things and kind of fusing that into uh, the non-kinetic targeting process and making sure people get what they need to actually create the effects you want to create and, and working the associated processes. Um, so that's you know, really diving into the realm of you're the guy who's going to have to be thinking about kind of the cognitive effects you're looking for um, or the actions you want to create or the information you want to deny or reveal. Um, and then taking in all the tools at your disposal, all the intel that may or may not be uh, aligned along those lines and making something out of it, communicating it through the three to the commander and, and operationalizing it into uh, tasks in support of uh, you know, IMOs and objectives. Sir, what was the second half of your question? <laughs> so, what, yeah, what are those skill sets that are, what, what would you do to change the G39 or the skill sets you'd add to it? And are those capabilities different at the tactile versus the operational level? Sir, and I'll, I'll take a stab at the, the tactile. <laughs> Some would argue Marines don't really do a whole lot above um, lightly operational. Um, so the ability to, how do I support the, the end state? Um, so from the Marine perspective, this is why we all go to TB, uh, the basic school. We all start out in a very infantry-centric mindset of I, war fighting is about winning, so I need to figure out what's going to win. Um, and I need to think like someone on the maneuver side, someone on the force protection side, someone on the intel side, and I need to bring that together for how I can support that end state. Um, so what it is, it's branching out of the myopic view of this is my, I'm in the information domain and I just do this thing, um, or I'm a log logistician, I only just do logistics. It's, it's a more comprehensive approach, so having that wide uh, view. And the second thing is looking at the adversary. Uh, one of the most important things, I, I think, from um, observant commanders is they're very quick to figure out where is the enemy and what can he do to me. And so, in the, the future, for the Marines, we're looking at competition. And so it's not necessarily a, I need to put a grunt on the ground with a, you know, a rifle and we're shooting things, but the, the actual competition space we're in might require a different approach to gain an advantage. So it's having that, that wider view of the end state um, that I think is what will really help integration for that 3-9 with the, with the 3 and with the commander. So I don't know if I would kind of add or change anything. The only thing I would offer is you are talking about such disparate timelines with some of these uh, equities. Sometimes this could take weeks, months, or years. Um, and so when you're looking at racking, stacking, scaffolding effects, like something may have to be, have been started three or four years ago. And just because the commander wants it now doesn't mean it will be. And so I would offer like just a greater uh, understanding of what those capabilities can actually do for you as a commander but understanding like not all of them are gonna be available at the drop of a hat. So like influence efforts, deception efforts, uh, garnering some of those relationships to ask people to do something on your behalf. Uh, like I said, could, it could take years, so. Yeah, Brian just hit on something that I, I was uh, thinking about and that's the time horizons that we're looking at. From a tactical perspective, I mean, yes, it's good to be aware of those longer time horizons, but arguably, uh, the further you get out of those long uh, time horizons, you're going more into a strategic view set. Um, you know, when we start talking like soft, and Brian's been pretty educational on this, is those getting that access and placement doesn't happen overnight. Uh, so when you get to the combatant command level or the component level, a lot of times they're trying to extend that horizon out so that it can become more uh, uh, controllable for them. And one of the things I kept coming back to is uh, when we talk about skills needed, uh, we're really good about talking about the operational environment and strategic environment as a complex system. We're doing things like net, net assessment or net analysis. And there's a really cool little diagram, I think it's in the 5.0, where it has a bunch of different nodes and they're all interconnected and then you got some colors that kind of describe each of the, the nodes. Uh, but how do we then flip that around and look at ourselves as a complex system that the adversary or other actors can then analyze or maybe they're perceiving us as that we're not quite uh, understanding. Um, and then that kind of ties into another trend that I've, I've uh, noticed both through my experience and then this past year in our engagements is 
we're really good at talking friendly force actions and the actions that we control. We're really good at talking about how do we go after the adversary uh, and degrade their capabilities and abilities. But what about those actors in between? Uh, how do we turn this from a binary system into something that accounts for multi-actor interactions and really starts to describe those complex systems? So it doesn't quite get to what you're talking about, but I think they all already hit those points. Uh, so really, would just kind of wanted to frame it from that perspective. Awesome. Thank you. And I believe we had one more question as well. So I'm Captain Michael from the Mission Command C did. So uh, you guys kind of think that the, con the construct of G39 was kind of meant to everyone to kind of understand that there used to be a PSYOP section somewhere else in a G shop, CA in a different G shop, and it kind of brought everyone together to kind of understand we've been very bad at information fracture side and never been able to actually make subsequent effects to actually give us a relative advantage in time to either leverage host nation partner forces, which is also supposed to be happening within that G39 cell, and kind of understanding then how does the soft triad work how are we generating those effects deep, close, and even in the rear, and kind of being able to actually start work that out, because it is a new concept, and fun fact, Indo-PACOM did just actually take a banning increase in their G39, because they themselves have kind of used, uh, even uh, uh, into, they've kind of understand that there's a big PLA influence that kind of has to be countered, but how are we actually doing that on our end, and we're kind of a little behind on this information fight, so it's kind of seeing how you guys kind of see your different functions, especially getting like CA, the PA and kind of understand how do you unite all those narratives and influence operations that actually generate effects. So I think that gets at one of our prime topics that we had, which was how do you, how do the staff processes you know need to adapt to better support uh, creation and exploitation of information advantage? And you're talking basically all those functions. How do they work together? Well, that's <laughs> you can figure that out. You know, I know some commanders that'll pay you to come work for them. Uh, <laughs> No, so like from a, per, from a PA perspective, this is one of the driving things that actually got me interested in my topic and I didn't want to write specifically on public affairs. I wanted to approach it from the joint uh, perspective. So there's this uh, study that was done in 2020 or 2021 by RAND and basically one of the big call outs was that public affairs, while doctrinally is supposed to be running this thing called the Commander synch uh, Communication Synchronization, they're not uh, trained or equipped to do so. They also don't even oftentimes have the, um, uh, the read-ins to go and run this thing in a valuable way. So they base the, one of the big call-outs was basically get public affairs out of their, their silo and go integrate with your three and your five. Now I personally um, have gone and done some of that, but it goes back to what some others have already commented on. This is like an individual kind of basis and I can tell you other people are doing that. But um, yeah, that's, that's a little bit of a tangent right there to kind of get, I feel your frustration and I don't know if we've come to that resolution yet, unless one of you guys has something. So, maybe to eat my own words, um, when, when, <laughs> when, when people say, I, I have a bone to pick when people say tactical, because I'm like, are you, do you mean a four-man team, or do you mean, I think a three-star equity is now in the FM is like still a tactical element. So from a core level down to a four-man team, that is like a, a wide breadth of operations, activities, investments that you can do. Um, and so do you, to your point about kind of the, the G39 or J39, like you should have at the division level an 05 CA officer, but that guy or gal is nothing more than like a glorified liaison because he's not on the ground doing anything. Um, and so, and then I think to your other point, in terms of narrative, there's a psyoper sitting two rows in front of you. And so between him <laughs> and between the public affairs guy, I will look at, okay, what do we want to amplify for some kind of domestic audiences? What do we, how do we want to look at crafting that themes and messages for foreign audiences? How do you want to do misattribution, disattribution? Um, and I'll let them play in the narrative space. I, as a CA officer, try to stay out of that and compliment what they're trying to do. But ultimately, it's like I think personality driven at the end of the day, like I bring both of them in and say, okay, what do, you, what do you guys want to do? And then how can I still get after my OAIs that I need to do working with other equities to kind of set the commander's PIRs in motion? Sure, and I was just going to add on, maybe to loop this back into the, the war fighting function concept. Um, when I started my thesis, I was like, I am done being a logo. I am, I'm going springboard into information. I want to do a thesis on deception. And I quickly realized I did not have the background to do a master's level product on deception. Um, but what I do have is a logistics background. Um, so for, and again, I hate to keep saying this, but for the Marines, when we look at pulling folks from other MOSs and bringing them into our information world, you can't, I don't think you can just drop your previous experience or your previous knowledge, but understand that 
We consider it a warfighting function, therefore everyone has a role in the information world. So the more we can communicate, you need to consider how your actions in competition affect this world that the PAO is gonna have to deal with, that civil affairs is gonna have to deal with. You can't just take, take, take. You have to consider. So I think pushing that understanding to the lower levels will help kind of feed that into your staff processes, can get ahead, um, and maybe have a little less friction um, in avoiding fratricide. So I've had many years and many hour long, multi hour long IO working group meetings to kind of ponder this because I've never actually seen anything get done in IOWG, despite it being <laughs> the doctrinal, um, doctrinal way in which these things are supposed to be integrated. Um, I think what it's come down to for me is uh, a couple different things that aren't exactly completely concrete. One of them, it is very much personality driven. Um, there's too much of a, a current concept of the three nine being the guys who hide behind the vault door and, and do special stuff, uh, and that's, that's not us. Um, it's a very small part of what we do. Um, we need to be forward out of the skiff with the three folks. Um, the other part of it is um, just enough process. I, I think, and I, I won't go too far into this because I think we have a related question, but uh, we have too much process and it um, tends to bog things down we really don't focus too much on what we're trying to achieve. We focus more on accomplishing tasks in the process. So I think finding the right balance between understanding what exactly the 3-9 in, or 3-9 equivalent in an organization at whatever level it's doing, what its actual mission is, tailoring the right level of process to that just enough to keep things from going completely chaotic um, and ensuring you have the right people with the right mindset uh, as to how they're actually supposed to be part of the staff and contribute to the mission um, are kind of the, the three general approaches I would take to um, kind of hitting that, that integration piece. And I, I know it's never satisfying to hear that part of the answer is um, personality-based, but I, I truly think that's a, that, that's a big part of it. Um, and that's something we can address as organization, organizational leaders um, you know, through how we hit PME and how we develop uh, others around us. Awesome, and I think we have time for one more question, and we there. Good afternoon, or morning, whatever time it is, I don't, I don't know. <laughs> um, I have a quick statement, and then a follow-on question. The panel sounds like, or I, it appears that, information is to be used as a supporting effort. Am I, am, I, am I hearing that correctly? Because our adversaries do not view it that way. And I keep hearing, okay, well, the three nine needs to be linked in with a three, um, first off, the Marines doctrine is phenomenal, I'll say that. Um, however, it sounds like it's supporting. Our adversaries don't view it that way. Do you believe, there's the question, do you believe that the United States from the top down with national strategy views information incorrectly and leverages it inappropriately? I think that's a tough one. Uh, as far as comparing apples and oranges, just because we have doctrine, we have the way we do things. Um, so to just recommend we just do a wholesale change, I think that would be a struggle. Um, but I do think that when we, we preach competition um, and that needs to be more information forward, I would still submit information as supporting because I just need my end state. Like I need to, I think what we lack is like a clear end state for this, um, which is something that maybe the, the US uh, mindset struggles with because we're pretty good at like I set a goal I'm gonna get to that goal uh, and we can iterate until we find a way to do that uh, when it's a little more ambiguous I think we struggle so I still think information is supporting but it's supporting the end state and that doesn't necessarily have to be a military or a big M response to things so I disagree with the first part. I, I think information <laughs> can be the main effort, and I, I didn't mean to characterize it as entirely supporting. The mission, the 3-9 may be supporting, may be information-centric at its heart. So I, I agree that information can be the main effort. Uh, in terms of how we actually get at it, um, I kind of had to deep dive into this in comparison with how the PRC does it for my thesis. And we're, we're kind of getting there. We're aware of it. Uh, we're aware of how the Chinese do it, specifically and where our gaps are, but we're still stuck in our own mindset with how to get at addressing that problem. Um, so 
I've seen us making strides in how we employ information as the main effort, um, at least within the big M and a little bit of a um, diplomacy recently, especially you saw on kind of the, uh, the Pacific Islands. Uh, man, we just crushed four deals in the span of a month. Um, China couldn't even manage two. Um, but we're not quite there yet. We still have a lot of, uh, a lot of issues with how we, how we conduct uh, strategy and, and kind of how we envision things. So I, I think Steve is right, but I also think we're playing like a garbage offensive information warfare game. Um, when you look at tenets of unrestricted warfare and three warfares, like we are not amplifying that back to the PRC in the same meaningful way. And the fact is, you, you can say it starts with the DOD and the fact that I can drop a JDAM faster than push out a tweet, right? That's the cliche. Mm -hmm. But I also think there's no unifying body of information at the national level. And so there is for every other tenet of national strategy, but there's, there's no like Department of Information Warfare to synchronize this and some people could point to the GEC and the State Department and I would offer like they're doing a terrible job as well and they're not going on the offensive as well as we need to be and we're losing that. Yep. So, 100% agree. Yeah, I, I like to talk in metaphors, so here you go. Uh, <laughs> I, I look at information as an inherent part of the environment, so I wouldn't categorize it as some sort of supporting effort uh, much as I wouldn't categorize, you know, like air as a supporting effort. I mean, you, how do you have air advantage, right? Information advantage should be looked at, I think, in the same way. And maybe to Brian's point, are we over here hyperventilating or holding our own breath when it comes to how we deal with information? I think that's possible. Uh, I could see that. But I mean, we're, we're processing information regardless of ever, whether we want to or not. We're making decisions whether we want to or not. It's just, are we, uh, oh man, I'm going to say a buzzword. Anyway, are we getting at that decision dominance that uh, a lot of people like to throw around? And it, I threw up a little bit, but sorry. Don't worry, <laughs> we'll, 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 we'll mute him for the next panel. Yeah. <laughs> so um, from the national level down, I would say that we're, maybe we're less garbage than Brian's saying, but the institutions that we could look to to actually uh, cohesively give us, you know, here's the strategy, the information strategy, maybe those don't quite exist, but I don't know if we're necessarily doing as poorly as we think, or if we're gonna compare ourselves to say like China, are we doing as bad as they are? Um, we kind of have some assumptions that we could talk to about that, but uh, I don't know if we're as trash as necessarily we'd make ourselves out to be. Now, getting down to the tactical level, we have a lot of assumptions that are based on, um, you know, essentially just faulty uh, information. So what does it mean to actually be in a degraded environment? Are we looking at that through uh, all, all different domains? You know, whether that's, and I'm going to mess up my terminology here, but whether that's looking at cyber EW, or are we strictly looking at things that can physically deny me from access? I think that's where we need to make a lot of uh, headway when it comes to the tactical level. All right, Ian. So uh, we, we are going to go ahead and uh, go on to our, uh, or take a break and head on to our next panel. We will have some additional time in the next panel for uh, some questions if you don't mind uh, sticking around. Uh, but uh, thank you. I can't imagine a better question as a way to kind of close that out uh, with some uh, uh, pretty pointed discussion. Uh, to me, one of my uh, big takeaways was, you know, it's, it's really easy, in, particularly in the military environment, to you know focus pretty heavily on organizational changes or process changes, uh, capabilities, and things like that. But you know, there's really no backing away from some of the intangibles that we really like to talk about, and ultimately, you know, how a lot of uh, these changes that we're looking at making are truly cultural in nature and require a lot of that human initiative. So, uh, thank you all for uh, your insights, perspectives. Uh, and for, uh, there, I know there are a few questions that we didn't get around to. Uh, please feel free to either come up, uh, speak to the panelists directly, or hold fire, and we will have more spicy fun in uh, about 10 minutes. So if you don't mind coming back at 11.05, we'll get started. Ha, ha, ha.